Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our next Nomensa webinar instalment, uh, hosted by our Head of Development here, Matt Wilkes, and Senior Account Manager, Fraser Groom. Uh, in today's webinar, uh, Building Public Sector Websites Effectively with Local Gov Drupal, uh, Matt and Fraser are going to take you through the key features and advantages of Local Gov Drupal uh, and explore how it provides uh, uh, tools for effective community engagement and ensures compliance with accessibility and security standards. Uh, as usual, please do join in with the discussion in the chat. Um, just make sure your chat settings are switched to uh, everyone and not just hosts and panelists so everyone can see your messages. Uh, and if you've got any questions, you can submit them for Matt and Fraser uh, using the Q&A function, and I'll get through as many as I can at the end. Um, we're using auto-generated captions. Um, there is a chance some of these might get a bit muddled live, um, as is the nature of these things, but we'll make sure these are all tidied up and accurate uh, when we post the recording on our YouTube channel uh, shortly after the webinar. Um, finally, uh, I'd just like to give a quick shout out to our partners, Acquia. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, Acquia are a digital experience platform uh, with open source Drupal at its core. Um, that enables uh, marketeers, developers, uh, and IT operations teams at thousands of global global organizations to rapidly compose and deploy digital products and services that engage customers, enhance uh, enhance conversions, and help businesses stand out. Um, if you'd like to learn more, I believe we've got a few of the team watching today, so please do ask any questions in the chat, um, or we'll follow up with some more info um, after the webinar ends. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Matt and Fraser. Thank you. So hi, uh, my name's Matt, and I'm the Head of Development at Nemensa. Uh, and that means I look after all sorts of aspects of our software delivery practice. So that especially includes Drupal and local Gov Drupal, but also includes things like modern web applications, um, software and technical and solutions architecture, quality assurance, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, and thanks very much, Henry. Uh, I'm Fraser, um, and as it says here, um, I'm a senior account manager in Immensa, but I'm also the head of our local government working group. Um, so, yeah, really pleased to be with you all, um, and of course my colleagues, my Nementsa colleagues here, and uh, just, yeah, to be talking about local Gov Drupal a little bit today. Um, as the title of the webinar suggests, we're going to be talking about building websites using local Gov Drupal, but the main focus is going to be on explaining why um, LGD is such a great option for local authorities when they're deciding um, on which new CMS to go with or whether to pick one up. Um, in, in the first case uh, to begin with. Um, so yeah, first up, Matt is gonna give you a bit of information on the background um, of local Gov Drupal and where it fits in with the wider government digital um, design system uh, and that whole space. Um, and then we're gonna get into talking about some of the particular ways that local Gov Drupal solves the most common problems that councils experience um, in this space. And we're gonna show you a couple of examples that we've prepared um, and show you how that works in application. Um, so yeah, Matt, Get us started, please, man. Absolutely. So uh, I think the last 10, 12 years have been really exciting for public sector digital in the UK. Uh, the GDS process has had such a wide impact across the entire world and has really been an exemplar of how we do public sector digital and public sector websites. And I've broken the history of that up into sort of four main sections. So the first one is the creation of the, the DDAC profession and uh, roles, as well as the service standard. And that's really around the, the formation of GDS. Then there's a period where a lot of the focus seems to be around uh, building applications and tooling that's used by lots of different people. Uh, then we move into the creation of the, the Gov UK front end and the design system. So again, looking for things that are used by everyone, but this time on a much more code level of like something that gets integrated into everything rather than an external service you can call out to. Uh, and finally, the, the section that I, I think we were in at the moment and for me what is most exciting about the digital practicing government at the moment has been the expansion of these approaches and these tools uh, into the local government space. Uh, and that includes things like the local digital declaration uh, and local Gov Drupal as well. Uh, so the local digital declaration, um, it will be familiar to many people who work in local government, uh, but I know there's many people here who, from other public sector bodies. If you've not read it, you absolutely should. Uh, it's quite long and it's difficult to pick out the most representative quote, but for me, this really sums up what local Gov Drupal is trying to achieve. Uh, it's about building services quickly, flexibly and effectively and unlocking our full potential. But if I go back to basics for a little bit, uh, 
when a lot of people think about GDS, they think about forms that look like this. Uh, and this particular form widget, the data input widget, is the one that really stands out for me. Not because it is a particularly complex challenge or a complex piece of code, but because of the background and the history and all of the work that went into getting to this point. It's a really great example of this evidence and research led approach that's dominated the public sector digital work in the UK. And it has had a huge impact across the web, uh, not just in the public sector, but all across government and internationally as well. So it's really not the field that's important. It's the journey that we, we went through to get to this field and all of the weight of information and evidence that backs it up. Uh, and the Gov design system is so successful because it does follow that pattern of applying evidence and uh, research to a shared problem that many people have across government. Uh, mm -hmm. And the problem that it's really like focused in on is that of transactional services. Uh, so that as a term broadly means um, services that allow people to exchange information, money, permission, goods, services. Uh, in this case, it's uh, between citizens and the government about changing a record, um, many, many things that you do every day with the government. Uh, and that's something that pretty much all central government departments do. However, that's not the only thing that central government departments do on the web. Uh, the other really important thing is they have lots of information that they need to, to distribute to disseminate to, to people. And that's not a transactional service, that's more broadcast, although people are get coming in looking to solve problems, so they do tie together. Um, for central gov, almost all of that content is on www.gov.uk, and that provides a content editing system for all the departments, and it lets them save by not having to stand up their own independent websites, but also it makes it much easier to communicate and coordinate the needs that users have across the whole of government and across departments, because really users shouldn't need to know what department is responsible for a piece of content, they go in with a question and they find their way through and it could touch one department it could touch multiple but what they care about is solving their individual problem and not the internal structures of government and this solve this site delivers really well against that need it's not just central government that has this pattern though lots of organizations do so for example the nhs has a really similar split where they've got a design system that uh, has a different focus, so it has a lot more information about healthcare advice. So, for example, on here, do's and don'ts lists. They've got alerts that are more about um, different levels of health risk. But they also have a primary website that goes beyond that design system in the same way that the GDS um, design system is expanded on for www.gov.uk, in that this site is just about disseminating content in a way that central, it's trusted, and it's easy to use. The thing uh, with local gov is a lot of these organizations have both of these challenges. They've got transactional services, things like my bin hasn't been collected, or um, uh, I don't know, uh, request a blue badge. Uh, mm -hmm. And they have lots of information that needs to be communicated to the public as well. And unlike central gov and the NHS, there's no single website that users go to for all local gov content, no matter where they live. They all have their own ones. And digital officers in local government have had to make use of a lot of this work that has been done centrally and by different departments that they do have access to because they're working in the open, but it's not an exact one-to-one -one mapping. They've had to find ways of applying the learning, determining which things are relevant to them, which things do they change, and do more research on top of that to applying it to their new context. There's lots of different ways that they vary. Uh, I've got a little uh, table on screen here that shows you some of the ones that we've thought of around branding, transactional services, content needs. Uh, but I really want to focus in on branding. Um, we have been talking about councils and local authorities here uh, because that's where local gov started, local gov Drupal, sorry, uh, and the clues in the name really. But any public sector body or actually anyone can use the software. Uh, it's open to everyone. Uh, and if they find it useful, they can adopt it and make use of it. And when we compare the needs of local authorities to uh, central government departments, we see quite a big difference. Uh, and the same is true of universities as well, and some arms length bodies. Uh, so some arms length bodies, people like, for example, DVLA, they act in many ways like a central gov department. They don't have much of a personality to their, their digital presence. Don't laugh. Um, but they, um, 
they, they want their very serious central government trustworthy within that framework in the way that um, departments, ministerial departments are. Other arms length bodies are very different. They want to have that relationship with end users. So for example, the Met Office is the same kind of body as DVLA, but it's a very different digital strategy. So for some arms length bodies, they're much more like central government departments. And for other arms length bodies, they're much more like local authorities. Uh, it's similar for universities as well. A lot of the challenges that universities have are similar to local authorities, or at least a lot more like a local authority than they are like a central government department. Uh, so um, uh, it makes sense that some of these uh, different approaches could be applied across multiple different mm. organizations. It's not just about local government, but about many different types of public sector body, depending on what their needs are. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, this this slide really just sort of to, to give you guys a, a forecast um, of what we're going to be talking about. Um, we split it up into four main value points or um, challenges that are posed within this space that local gov Drupal really serves to um, try and resolve. Um, the way that me and Matt are going to split this up, being in sort of uh, client services, I'm going to be talking more about value um, and where value is being added and, um, and things of that nature. Uh, and Matt is really just to sort of fill in with the um, to reinforce my points with with examples, technical aspects, and um, to show you that I'm not, you know, just sort of making all of this up. But um, where we're going to start is um, something which I think a lot of people can sympathise with when doing projects like this is the lack of visibility of the final product um, when doing a design or build project. Project. Um, so yeah, as I was saying, anyone that's been a part of a design or build start project uh, is probably going to be able to tell you that the beginning of the project is often the most difficult part, uh, mainly due to the fact that you're going to be surrounded by concerned stakeholders, uh, people who really just want to know um, what exactly it is they spent their money on. Um, and as Matt was explaining earlier, content management systems like Drupal, like, uh, like WordPress um, and others um, exist under the understanding that while every site is going to be different, some ubiquitous elements um, like form creation, login pages, um, they're not going to be hugely different. Um, and most site creators can mostly get by with default formats um, that can use these as a foundation to quickly build upon. So this quick, uh, this quirk uh, of CMS saves a lot of time already, but where local gov Drupal um, takes things even further uh, is by recognizing the needs of their smaller set of potential users and providing a baseline that is far closer to what you're what you're actually going to need. And um, so by quickly building upon this foundation uh, that Matt's highlighted before, um, you can draw from local gov Drupal's preset configurations, color palettes, and you can use uh, council images or content that you're already going to have sitting around and you can um, even select which pre-configured templates best suit your individual needs are uh, all the ones that stakeholders are going to be most concerned uh, to know how they're going to end up at the end of the project. Um, and by doing these things, you'll find yourself um, much quicker getting towards what the site is going to look like and what it's going to feel like um, after the components are developed, when they're hooked in with your backend systems. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's fair to say that in a normal build project, things like this can take several sprints or months worth of development time um, if you were starting from scratch. So yeah, handing back over to Matt just to show you how quick some of these things can be. Absolutely. So uh, as with many things in local gov Drupal, the user facing front end and the theming has been designed in a way to get you going really quickly. So what I want to do is demo what that looks like, practically speaking, for your first few minutes as a, a front end developer, someone applying branding to a local gov Drupal site. Um, to do that, I had to pick a site that we were going to make local of Drupal look like. Uh, obviously, you would do this for your own website or your own brand guidelines. I could have just picked a council, but I didn't want anyone to think that I was picking one that made it easy uh, or singled out. So what I've done is I've decided to try and make local of Drupal look like the Nemensa website. Uh, so on the next slide, I'm going to show you a, a brief animation that starts off with the uh, local gov Drupal demo yeah. site, then we pair it back to the base theme by disabling the demo stuff and we build on top of that. So this is what it looks like. We start off as the demo, we switch to the, the base purple, and then we're going to start adding things in like logos, changing the colors that are being used, changing the fonts, uh, adapting which parts of the site use which color from the palette, so changing the header to be black rather than pink. Then we can start by adding in some of the uh, 
design assets are the the images um, uh, and bits of their wording, uh, and we can then do some final little tweaks. And the outcome of this is that really very rapidly we go from a site that looks nothing like the Nomensa website and looks like a demo of a piece of software because it is, uh, but then it turns into something that you can show to other stakeholders and they say, oh yes, that, that looks like our website. It turns it from being a demo into being a demo of the Nomensa website in local GovDrupal. Uh, and this this took very little time. Uh, if you were doing this from scratch, the majority of your time would be getting set up with the development environment. If you've done it before, it's very little. It was, I think, 20 minutes at most uh, in between other things. And it actually involved only 30 lines of code to get from that base theme into the version that looks like the next version of this. Yes. Yeah. yeah, no, exactly. And um, I think it's, it's, it's fair to say I mean, that, that's, a, that's a really good example, um, but I think it's fair to say that those experienced with these kinds of projects um, will probably know that quick wins um, that I think this tries to show off um, in, in build projects like this can be really difficult to locate and having one so early in the project um, can go a really long way to setting a positive um, tempo and just sort of, I hate to use this word, but vibe um, for the project and uh, just ensuring stakeholder buy-in. Um, just recently, Matt and I saw how valuable it is to spin up a quick demo um, version of the site like this one we just showed you earlier. Um, we kicked off a local Gov Drupal design and build project just a couple of months ago. And um, yeah, honestly, being able to mitigate those common concerns of complexity, um, of scope creep, cost by actually coming into that meeting um, with a demo in your back pocket um, just sets the mood for the project amazingly well. You can just see the tension. Um, evaporating from the room as soon as it comes on screen. And while the upfront visibility is obviously also a major benefit um, to using local Gov Drupal, um, this transparency never really goes away. Um, having something that's so tangible stood up so early on the project that can also be tweaked and updated as you get further along the road of refining your requirements um, means that there should always be something for people to get, the ha get their hands on at the end of every dev or design sprint. Um, assuming you want to go with Agile. And um, yeah, I think ultimately giving this confidence enables people to worry less um, and listen more, um, to spend more time paying attention to the individual needs of your community um, and to make sure that their requirements are being reflected in the end result, as opposed to spending loads and loads of time just trying to get up to a level where you can even start thinking about that. Um, and yeah, speaking of your uh, constituents, of your users, um, the second point that we're going to be talking about here is um, one of the concerns uh, that people experience in this space is difficult to use or inaccessible CMSs um, that are just a pain uh, for users or the councils that are standing up these sites. Um, so in a 2021 piece of telltale research, that fair warning, I will be referencing uh, a couple of times, but 52% of survey councils um, cited ease of use for end users and citizens as their reason for wanting to change CMS. Um, and yeah, as luck would have it, you, uh, ease of use, flexibility, recognizability, uh, as we saw in the beginning of this uh, webinar, are all core aspects uh, and part of the foundation of local Gov Drupal and what it was built upon. Um, Matt is going to back up what I'm saying here with a few more examples that will um, show how easy it is to make changes to your site once it's, uh, well, when you're putting it together and after it's live. Um, but when we're talking about starting from scratch, there's a couple of things that I just want to mention. So, the fact that local gov Drupal was made in recognition that there are similar needs being shared between all councils, um, it means that what you get out of the box um, already puts you the vast majority of the way to adhering to web development best practice guidelines. Um, having this um, in hand right off the bat means that you can dedicate more of your thinking time um, towards what challenges are specific to your council and addressing those needs um, without worrying so much about you know, getting the basics off the ground and being based on the government design system, as Matt's been referring to, um, local Gov Drupal comes in a format that most um, people uh, are going to recognise very easily if they've used the internet in the UK before to complete essential tasks like renewing a passport, um, completing vehicle registration. Um, and I think pairing this recognition of the flow of sites that look like this and serve similar needs um, with high levels of flexibility um, of the local Gov Drupal site, um, as far as council content curators um, 
will be concerned. It just means that it's far easier to make sure that your council's website maintains this ease of use while continuing to still feel like it is you and your constituents are dealing with their council as opposed to a generic um, just sort of base plate um, demo site. Um, so yeah, just going to pass back over to Matt for a couple more examples. Great, thank you. So uh, I've got a few on screen here. Um, these, along with all the other examples that I'm going to be showing you, are styled with that initial styling that I just demoed to you. There's been no additional tweaks. This is literally just that very first uh, quick applying the branding. Um, some of the most important users for a council are the residents, obviously. So it's really important that the site be easy to, to use for them. Uh, and local gov Drupal really guides content editors into creating content that is going to be really usable uh, and with that evidence led backing to that, why these decisions have been taken. Uh, I've got two examples to talk you through. Uh, the one on the left is what local gov Drupal calls a step by step or step by step page. And this is giving information about part of a, a, a longer running process. So it's not a thing of like, go on and find the three things you need to do uh, today in order to, to get this thing done. It's things where you go on and say, okay, what's the first step in this? What do I need to know so I can go away, I can work on that and I can come back when I'm ready for the next point. Uh, and those lots of uh, many, like many interaction um, uh, systems that we have with councils. So the way this has been set up, we've got the main content on the left where you'd expect it. It's really clearly signposted, but it's part of a step-by-step. -step. So if someone finds their way into a part of it, they can get back to the overview. And on the right, we've also got a map of where you are in that process, a summary of the current section, what's happened before, what's coming next. And you can really easily navigate there to say, okay, what are the expectations I should have for this? Uh, and the fact that these are set up out of the box means that you don't have to do that thinking we were talking about earlier of researching what things should be on the page, uh, mm -hmm. what should the fields be, how should we lay it out. We've got a default here that has already been really thought through and you can use that as a basis for saying, do I want to make changes or do I want to just stick with what's already there and those changes can then be really evidence led. Um, on the right, uh, another one maybe a little less exciting is news. Lots of different websites have news. Uh, it's built into a lot of CMSs for that reason, but the version that's in local gov Drupal has been tweaked slightly to be really useful for, for councils. And primarily, I think that is just the way it's displayed. It's been put together in a way that is really familiar to councils. It's got all your normal fields like images, text, dates. You've also got a dedicated search for the news and you've got categorization that you can use for filtering it and also filtering by date is available out of the box as well. Um, that's just one of the types of user. Um, the, uh, the other really important one is content editors because you need your content editors to find it easy to work with your website in order to have a good experience and to really get the most out of it. Uh, and the work that has been put into local gov Drupal by the councils and the other suppliers who've been working on it over the years has been really great to, to get it to that level. Uh, and there's a really active community that means that feedback from new content editors learning the system constantly gets fed back and used to, to drive improvements. Uh, so I'm just going to show you a really quick demo of what it's like to go into the uh, content management system for the first time and make a simple change. Uh, in this case, I want to rearrange birth, deaths and marriages and libraries, leisure and culture. So I hit edit and go to the page builder. And I just find the piece of content I want, drag it to the right, drag the other one to the left in its place and hit save. And then it has been rearranged. So it's a really simple, intuitive way of people going in and editing content and really helps them get started very quickly indeed. Uh, and I think because local gov Drupal is in use by many councils in the UK and because it's based on that really well regarded, really popular open source content management system Drupal that's used across the industry. Uh, it's a really great way of providing good professional development for content editors because they have some really transferable skills here, both inbound and outbound. I've got a quote on here from people talking about what it would be like going from a council that uses LGD into another one. You've already got a lot of those skills, but also people coming in and out of uh, the public sector. Uh, they're not learning a bespoke tool that's only used in one organization. They're using industry standard tools and learning things that they can apply over and over again. Yeah, and I think that um, flows very nicely into our, our next point um, as well when it comes to actually, you know, imagine your site is already 
um, it's up life. How are you going to maintain it? How are you going to make sure that it has the maximum amount of life cycle? Um, because you know, if you're going through this process, it's pretty likely you're, you're not going to want to do it again um, in just a year or so's time. You're probably going to want to keep it live for as long as you can. And a way to, um, to do that is by making it nice and easy to maintain. So um, to sort of uh, prove that point, I'm going to refer again to that piece of telltale research that I brought up um, before. Um, this piece of research discovered that around 25% of councils that are looking to obtain a new CMS um, are going to be concerned with how difficult the site is going to be to maintain after all dev hands are off and you've reached the point where you're ready to go live. Um, I do think this is actually probably a, a more commonly felt um, concern uh, within procurement teams or just generally on project teams. Um, so I think it's it, it's quite widely applicable. Um, and luckily, yeah, this is another area where local gov Drupal um, squashes some of these concerns and actually takes advantage on drawing on a natural resource that you will already have within your council to make life a little bit easier. Um, so I think, uh, we think that it's an undeniable fact and a huge asset to councils, um, that there's already a massive amount of talent within local government digital teams and uh, a major benefit for local people is that it's able to um, harness these skills and empower councils to create champions from their existing workforce um, that can then take on the responsibility of maintaining the site without the barrier of being beholden to an external organization to make content or stylistic changes to your site. Um, a successful design or build um, project implementing local gov Drupal naturally will entail uh, a one team approach that will also offer opportunities to upskill existing members of your team, um, providing opportunities to learn more about how the CMS works in both the front um, and the back end, how to establish clear sets of council specific content guidelines, um, things like tone of voice, um, and how to keep tabs on the accessibility and the inclusivity of your site, which is something that local gov Drupal addresses right off the bat um, in its accessibility compliance coming out of the box, but also makes it nice and easy to keep front of mind, which is something that is essential um, for local government authorities. Um, by sharing this knowledge and, and building on existing capability with the council, um, you not only become more self-sufficient, but you can leverage the fact that you know your users and their needs better than any external organization ever is going to. Uh, and one of the core aims of local government is to help council stand independently um, together, if that makes any sense. So they can have the option of using external organizations or they can be uh, beholden to themselves, but they're still going to exist within that community, which we're going to talk about a little bit more later. Um, so yeah, just to put a cap on that, by educating your teams uh, on these core concepts, as well as how to maintain the site after it goes live, it makes partnering with an external organization um, to maintain the site uh, an option as opposed to an obligation. Um, and building that capability in-house is so incredibly valuable for preserving the life cycle um, of a new website. And yeah, a few more examples, Matt. Yeah, absolutely. So as Fraser says, there's there's a lot of different options. Uh, and the key thing here is flexibility. Uh, you aren't required to do everything in house and you're not required to outsource everything. You can pick an approach that works best for you for the skills you have in house. Uh, and that can really vary over time. What you need in year one can be very different to what you need in year five of, of having the website. Uh, there's a really great ecosystem of suppliers and experts in this space in the UK. Uh, I've mentioned this before, but because it is based on a really popular open source content management system, there's a really wide range of people who can supply uh, you in different ways for this. So um, first off, lots of councils will already have uh, people within their tech teams who are aware of Drupal who have experience customizing it. Like It's entirely possible that you have people already working in your organization who have experience in developing in this and who can do much of this proof of concept work, especially. Mm -hmm. um, going a little further than that, there are many contractors, freelancers, uh, individuals who work within Drupal in the UK, who can be brought into supplement transformation teams on a short or longer term basis, if you that is a specific need that you have. Uh, and then there's uh, a whole continuum going up through support contracts up to uh, appointing a, a digital agency to manage a, an entire delivery and form a, a one team culture, but offering a lot of these digital transformation skills externally rather than having to bring them in-house if that's not something that you need. 
Uh, in the same way, the technology stack is really um, familiar to lots of people who work in, in council IT. Uh, so it can be self-hosted in whatever cloud environment you're standardized on. Uh, it could be AWS, it can be Azure, it can be Google Cloud Platform. Uh, and there's a range of other hosting options as well. So the small like challenger suppliers who might be for example, really local to your area or particularly green, uh, all the way through to uh, really reliable enterprise grade specialists in Drupal like Acquia. Um, and yeah, just my last point on that, uh, and obviously it's going to lead naturally into this, um, that same research that I keep banging on about, it confirms a question that causes a lot of anxiety within um, uh, procurement teams, is how long am I going to be shackled to an Excel partner um, after the majority of the need? Um, for their support expires um, and all of the capability aspects that we've been talking about should help to address this um, pretty significant concern when it comes to the cost of these sorts of projects and yeah obviously that leads me um, to my final point being uh, in the client services team I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about something commercial but it should come as absolutely no surprise to anybody that cost is going to be the primary barrier to local government authorities in their selection of a new CMS whether it just influences their choice ultimately of the platform that they'll go with um, or whether it precludes um, their ability to switch over entirely um, or embark upon the project in the first place so and some of the core parts of the local government Drupal um, ethos include working in the open and rely on earlier adoptions of the platform to share their plans um, and experiences with complete transparency um, and this pairs really nicely with the space that LGD operates in um, essentially uh, it's an unselfish recognition um, that if we liken councils to businesses, then their communities um, are their clients. And because of that, there's no need to compete between local authorities. There's no crossover just by the nature of what local authorities do. Um, and the big takeaway for a lot of organizations attending this webinar is that a lot of the decision points and fact finding that so often take up a huge percent of the budget of a project like this has already been done. By those that came before you and that's not a secret that's a purpose uh, of local web Drupal and I think this is really in the spirit of the ethos that I mentioned and echoes with the core benefit of the platform when you know that every council is just out there trying to best serve their community reflect their needs why wouldn't we collaborate why wouldn't we post our questions and answers transparently so that people um, that come after us don't have to spend time needlessly solving problems and spending money uh, answering questions that people have already found the answer to. Um, and I think the flexibility of the platform also means that you're not just copying someone else's method. Um, you're able to see the way that they've solved um, problems before and then apply that methodology to finding your own solution in a much more timely fashion, but maintaining the identity and the personal touch that your constituents will expect um, from the authority that provides all of the crucial services that they need in their day-to-day -day lives uh, and continuing to make it feel like they're still dealing with their council. Um, and yeah, Matt, back over to you again, man. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I think that point about the, the upfront discovery and planning out is a really valuable one. Um, I want to talk specifically about alert banners because there's a few different things that can happen with alert banners on a, a website. Um, the kind of the best case scenario is when you're planning out your website, it occurs to you, we're going to need the ability to really rapidly show announcements to the public. And if so, you'll do some research on, okay, what are the things I need to do, plan it out, what, you know, what types of banner are there, who's going to need to do them, all this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I say that's the best case, because the worst case is it doesn't occur to you during that initial uh, set up and you only realize that you need the ability to share announcements at the time you need to share your first important announcement and then rather than making use of a piece of functionality that you understand you're trying to find ways to achieve that within the, the scope of what you have mm. so I want to show you what local Gov Drupal gives you out of the box uh, and hopefully you'll agree that it uh, saves a lot of that planning work so we choose to edit the alert banners content and add a new one. Uh, at this point, we choose the type of the alert. That can be an announcement, a minor alert, an emergency, or the death of a notable person. Uh, I've chosen an announcement of a host pipe ban in effect because I wrote this uh, a few days ago and at that point it seemed plausible. Uh, if we then save that, we get a preview. Uh, there's a few other options I won't go into, but we can choose to hide all the others. There we 
publish it. And if we now go back to the home page, we can see that announcement has shown up immediately uh, and is available for, for everyone. Yeah. Uh, there's another thing that I'd like to, to demonstrate. This one's called uh, directories. And this is a piece of functionality that allows you to show the location of multiple related things within your area. So this can be things like um, rental cycle docking stations. It could be recycling stations. It could be schools. It could be care providers. Um, there's loads of different things that councils need to show to people to so they understand the, the facilities that are available in their area. Mm. So if I show you creating this in local Gov Drupal, first off, we need to create a, a type of thing that we're going to show. Uh, and I decided that I would do uh, Edwardian swimming pools for this. Um, it's your specialist subject on Mastermind. Absolutely. I mean, we all need a list of Edwardian swimming pools, don't we? Uh, so we just choose a few options there. We save it. And I'm just going to publish this. We've now got an empty list of them. Uh, and I'm now going to go in and add a couple of examples. So I add a directory venue. That's an item within that. Uh, and I'm going to call it Withington Baths. Ah, oh, quality. I give it a location. Uh, for this, I create an address. Uh, I'm going to search by postcode. And it will automatically show you a map preview of where it is, and give you latitude and longitude information. That's all been derived from the postcode automatically. Uh, we then can fill in other information. There's metadata here about exactly what it is, but also um, text that shows up when people are viewing it. In here, we can then decide to publish that. If I then go in and add another one, because there's no real use having just one item in a directory. The whole point of it is to show you multiple things so you can see how they're interacting. Um, again, we set up the, the metadata for this and we choose a location. Uh, once again, I'm going to search by postcode, but you can also search by street address if you like. So you can start typing in and get suggestions as to where it is. Again, we've got the map preview, latitude and longitude, and we can save that. And then if we publish this and go back to the list of Edwardian swimming pools, we can see that those two items have been brought together. There's been a map automatically put in that has been scaled in such a way as to really demonstrate where the things are. In this case, they're in two different cities, so it has been zoomed to show the two cities. If they were within a neighbourhood, it would be much more zoomed in. Yeah. We have a list underneath so that people aren't relying on only the map. The map enhances content, but it's still really accessible. And on the left, we have search, and we have lots of options here to add in um, facets into the search so that people can filter based on aspects of the items in there, such as if the, the pool also has a, an associated gym, for example, these things can all be integrated really easily into this page. Very nice. And um, yeah, I think these are, these are really useful examples because anyone who has experience with running these sorts of sites before um like they may be familiar with the concept that if somebody comes up with an idea to to support this sort of functionality it may you may find yourself going down a path where you know you're talking to an external organization you're you're scoping it up you're engaging in a long project and this just gives you the power to reduce costs by just taking care of it yourself and as we were sort of saying before, like there's probably going to be champions within your council already already there who can take care of this stuff for you. Uh, and it just means that you can just be independent. Um, and when it comes to a costing perspective as well, ultimately, whether you work for a council and you're attending this webinar or, or whether you're not, um, you're a community member that likely cares about the way that public money is spent. And I think by working transparency uh, transparently, um, with other councils and eliminating this need to spend time um, answering questions that have been solved before by by coming by coming across these answers that are already transparently put out there. It's it's just response. It's it's just a responsible way to go about spending public funds. Um, I think it's safe to say. And yeah, as someone who works in the supplier space, it, it's probably not my responsibility to say this, but I think most people would agree that um, any money that can be saved in the ways that we've been discussing above. Um, or previously that can be diverted towards solving more pressing, more important, more council specific issues um, is ultimately a good thing and um, something that local GovDrupal really helps uh, sort of further that cause. Uh, and I think that's that's just something that's worth pointing out. 
Uh, so the last thing I want to talk about really is the community around local Gov Drupal because it, it really is a key part of, of the success. Um, we wouldn't have this software if there weren't really talented, really passionate people in the community who were driving forward and uh, contributing as individuals, their suppliers, as a councils, there's a whole range of people. Uh, and it's a really supportive and really good community to be a member of. There's a load of talented people throughout councils, as, as we've said, and um, it makes no sense to have those talented people solving the same issue over and over again in isolation and having that community really helps back that up of having people you can go to and discuss things get ideas hear about what worked what didn't work uh, and that really ties back into that local digital declaration uh, of working from those common building blocks so that people can do their best work and freeing up the really talented people so that they can do um, everything that they need to uh, and it really allows us to to benefit uh, across the whole space yeah um, one of the ways that people contribute as well not just by the real-time community is um that that depth of uh, knowledge and that depth of uh, uh evidence that is being built up over time across all these different councils and there's loads of different ways that that information and those specialists contribute back to it that's things like blog posts show and tell sessions the software itself uh, all of these things uh, user experience and accessibility are, are really core skills to have within a council transformation team so it's not unusual that it is a way that lots of the, the contributions happen uh, so I just put up a few snippets of some blog posts that people within the the community have published uh, in the past few months um, and it really gives a way for these uh, practitioners to, to push forward the state of the art and to help the other councils um, personally I found it really interesting sitting on some of the research sessions learning about that the really in-depth work that they've been allowed to do by the fact that they're not struggling on the basics because they've got a, a content management system that supports them. Things yeah. like the work that Essex County Council did on the accessibility of blue badges was been really fascinating. Um, as I said, it's, it's software. So there's always gonna be a way of contributing by contributing to software. Uh, and a really key way uh, of doing that is, is from writing the code, but also from having ideas talking to other users testing things out all of these things bug reports documentation ideas are really valuable contributions uh, an example of this is the the cookie compliance functionality again this is something that lots of councils have to deal with um, uh, and because it is a really good shared problem it's a really uh, interesting way to to collaborate so the cookie compliance work in local good group was started out with Croydon doing some work and it's then been picked up by other councils such as Brighton and Hove and Essex County Council who've been able to do more work on top of what Croydon have done drive things forward more and also share those learnings back so that the other users it's kind of local good Drupal in microcosm almost you know mm -hmm. not everyone is using this feature but the ones that are are having that full benefit of the community uh, and there really is no other model that I'm aware of where a council can invest in solving a problem and work really hard on something, then have other councils not only benefit from it, but stand on the shoulders of your work, push things even further and improve your website based on the fact that you've worked in the open and you've helped them to, to build theirs. Thank you very much. That, that's everything we have prepared. I'll hand back over to Henry. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Um, thanks, Fraser. Yeah, so much useful information in there. Um, yeah, I love I love what you're saying about, you know, the benefits of sharing that that knowledge and those learnings between councils and, you know, how you can harness those, you know, to really help help many local authorities continuously prove it's amazing. Um, yeah, if anyone has any questions for Fraser or Matt, please do submit them now, um, either in the chat or the Q&A box, um, expecting a, a deluge of questions for you. <laughs> Edwardian swimming pools now, Matt. Um, uh, Matt, you um, you touched briefly on kind of managing content, um, but what about migrating it? Can you talk a little bit about kind of existing content um, and just just kind of how how straightforward that is? Yeah, sure. So um, I, I think content teams, uh, as I mentioned, are an, another really key stakeholder in a place where there's lots of talent within councils uh, and lots of these teams are really driving things forwards. So 
first off, it kind of depends on where you are with your content. You know, if you have a content team who have maybe done an audit of the content that you have in place, or they've maybe um, like been monitoring things over a long period and they've got a really solid amount of content that they're really happy with, then there's a few options for migration. Uh, Drupal has support for automated migrations. Uh, there's some details about how you pull that information out. It depends a little on the content management system you're moving from. It depends a little on how uh, the content maps together, but there are automated options that you can do. Maybe a little less, um, if you're a little less up to date with how you want the content to be, uh, this can actually be a really great time to, to do that reset and say, you know what, we are going to do an audit as we move across. And then it, it gives us a, an opportunity to do that all in one go in a structured way rather than to, to do it as a, uh, as a separate project. Uh, and in that case, um, again, probably a mixture of automated and manual can be really helpful. Um, you probably do want to automate things like migrating uh, any PDFs, although hopefully we, we're having fewer and fewer PDFs on uh, council websites, uh, because the effort of downloading them and re-uploading them doesn't add much. Again, you want to focus your time on where your your staff can really add value. Mm. Um, I would say as well, actually, that um, the content team um, being involved in that content uh, moving process, even if they're not doing the move themselves, if they're doing some proof of concepts, trying things out, uh, that's a really great way to get them uh, accustomed to the things in local GovDrupal and to get ideas flowing of, oh, we could use this feature for this and that would help us improve. So even if you've got a really solid set of content, um, it, it's an opportunity for mapping that content into the the benefits that local GovDrupal has and the, the, the deeper content cool. types it has. It's a, re it's a really positive way to just sort of sweep um, if you're going through that transformative process anyway, you're going to be wanting to, to bring everybody into like a really positive um, new era. And I think especially looking at content, using that as an example to bring your subject matter experts in the particular divisions of your council and making them aware of what all the new possibilities are, you're just going to get closer to creating those champions that we talked about, making people more self-sufficient um, and uh, yeah, it's just it's it's kind of kind of uplifting in a way, just sort of getting these people together and um, getting people excited um, about the possibilities of moving over to, to local gov Drupal, which is something that it just does so well. Awesome, thank you. Um, so we've got um, a few questions um, that, that have been submitted. Um, so first up, question um, from Andrew. I've noticed all our questions are from people called Andrew as well, which is strange. Um, <laughs> The so first question from Andrew Gresham uh, asks, uh, how easy is it to build forms and uh, integrate to backend systems? That's a really good question. So there is a functionality in Drupal uh, called Web Forms that has a form builder interface that allows you to do single page forms, multi-page wizards, uh, conditional set, uh, pages on the form. Uh, it allows you to, to use lots of different um, that field types and there's lots of connectors available as well so out of the box you get connectors to save it to the database so you can go into the back end and see a table of the submissions uh, you have connectors to send emails uh, these two are really useful for building in a feedback form to the site for example because it allows you to um, get that in a way that's really accessible to the, the content team but then there's the transactional side of things as well uh, and there is a lot of work currently going on across councils to see what is the best way of approaching that. Uh, some people uh, divert um, the forms out to an external provider that they already have. Others are looking at using iframes to kind of embed those external forms within the page and style them. Uh, and there are quite a few councils looking at the moment at building those connectors to push things into backend systems like Mendix and um, Dynamics 365, all, all these types of um, uh, processing providers where you're using Drupal as the front end for data collection and pushing into a business logic system for the back end. So uh, I would say that there's a lot of flexibility and it's a way that um, you can contribute and drive forward the state of the art. Uh, it's not yeah. something that is a solved problem because lots of councils have different providers and different priorities. So it's not there's not one there's no one size fits all answer for everyone. Yeah, but I think as well, like it, just on the topic of obviously, I don't have a technical answer to this necessarily, but um, on the topic of 
transparency and just the community itself, this being an open topic of conversation when you actually join the community, they'll, I think there's even like a dedicated like channel or channel within the Slack instance, which is dealing particularly with these items. And it's honestly as, as transparent as if you want to learn more, you just join the channel, you join the community and you can just ask like, hey, where, where are people at? And you'll see all of the work that people are doing on it already. Who They're very excited, very motivated to share this information because everyone's just, yeah, join, sort of joined together in the purpose of acknowledging that it's a, it's a commonly felt issue um, and um, wanting to solve it together. So yeah, any contributions um, are, are most welcome, but just wanting to know where the progress is, is also totally valid. Lots of councils are happy to demo things as well. They often have like uh, regular demo sessions where they show what they're currently working on. Yeah. Awesome. No, I love I love all this knowledge sharing between councils. It's great. Um, so yeah, next question from Andrew Hick. Um, Andrew asks, thanks for the demo. Uh, you've touched on accessibility a couple of times. Uh, can I ask what kind of work has been done to evaluate the components and templates for accessibility? So there was an accessibility audit um, during the, the first major release of local Gov Drupal. Uh, and I know, again, from, from that community transparency, that there is uh, work happening at the moment. Uh, the, there is an accessibility working group within local Gov Drupal who put a huge amount of effort into uh, ongoing uh, evaluation and improvements. Uh, and we're, we're gearing up at this point to, to do another sort of more formal audit of like, where are we at the moment? What should our mm. next priorities be? Yeah, I think that's that's obviously a very, very important factor and somewhere that councils don't want to be caught lacking. Um, and it, LGT being based um, sort of on the premises of the, um, the government design system puts you in a much better position. There'll be less to do um, depending on what you want to do um, with the platform. But yeah, as Matt says, like it's an open topic of conversation um, and a need that all councils have together. And because of that, it's something that everybody is working towards making sure um, that it's as compliant out of the box to 2.1, um, work out 2.1 and 2.2 when that comes out um, very soon. Yeah, that, that there's been a, a fair amount of conversation I've seen around um, for example, the focus indicator states in 2.2 AAA, not to get too uh, into the weeds of the technical stuff here, but uh, how that should be um, brought into the platform and, and to sites as to uh, now that that has moved from AA into AAA, uh, is this something that we should be looking at? Is it something that we should be uh, building into to exceed the minimum that's expected? Yeah. It's definitely something that <laughs> a conversation that Immense is very interested in being sort of involved to a certain degree in the the, the generation of the 2.2 guidelines. Um, but yeah, watch this space. Cool, thank you. Um, so next question uh, from Andy Lam. Um, Andy says, hi, it's been a long time since I've worked with Drupal. How easy is it to migrate from a local development in, uh, install to a server? The tooling's got loads better. It really has. So um, there's a couple of helper tools locally that allow you to export everything into the zip files that you can then import directly into your server. There's also a load of work that's been done around um, synchronizing configuration. So you can make changes to the configuration and then deploy those uh, up. So you're deploying config and code up and bringing um, content and examples down. Um, it it is software development. There are there are going to be things that uh, you need to introduce into processes, but um, it's really common for um, non developers to spin up um, proof of concept builds and to get involved in this kind of thing within a a local Gov Drupal project if they have uh, an interest in technology. Thank you. Nothing to add. Um, so uh, so uh, Andrew Gresham. Uh, asks, are there any inbuilt uh, integrations to case management or CRM systems? So that kind of ties in with the forms question before. It, it's not inbuilt, but there are uh, into local Gov Drupal, but because it's based on Drupal and we use the Drupal web forms module, there are a lot of things there that are ready to go, but they're ready to go as in like it will get you really close and you'll do a bit of work to, to customize it rather than you click a button and it, it all works. So uh, Drupal does have integrations with 
um, things like Dynamics 365 with things like um, Salesforce uh, that can be integrated into the web forms module to build that. But it, it would obviously be a bit of a conversation between the people building the web form, the people responsible for the uh, the CRM in the back end, if they're not the same person, the linkages between them. It's it's a very tractable problem. It's not something that you, you just, it's, it's not part of the core set that is immediately given to everyone. Awesome, thank you. Um, and Andrew also asks, uh, which version of Drupal is LGD built on um, and how are the upgrades and security patches managed? Uh, it's currently on version nine. Uh, there is a beta of version 10, which is being tested at the moment and we're hoping to uh, be upgrading to it very soon. Um, the, the major version upgrades for Drupal have gotten a lot better over the years. Um, there's a lot of discussion in the community at the moment as to uh, how much should be possible for councils to do without involving a developer. Um, I, I think it's most common for people to have someone responsible for maintenance, whether that's someone on the IT team or a contracted person or service. Uh, that person can then be doing your regular security updates. So uh, there are often patch releases of Drupal that apply really cleanly. Uh, and in the same fashion, there's often bug fix releases of things in local of Drupal, adding new features as well uh, is really common. So um, you would want to spend a little time on, on doing those regular patches. Uh, in fact, I think there's some um, NCSC guidance about how like, one of the most important things that you can do when you're procuring uh, or, or adopting an open source content management system is not assuming that it's set and forget. Uh, there are also, um, yeah, there's, there's lots of options for, for ways that you can apply that. They are generally speaking relatively small. There is the annual kind of um, major version upgrade and that's again, not as nowhere near as bad as you might expect. It's, it's a little work, but not very much. Brilliant, thanks Matt. Um, uh, so our next question uh, asks, uh, is it easy to add a customer account slash login, say, if someone wants to check something they've submitted? Absolutely. So there's um, there's a user management function that you can go into. You can add users. Um, it will send them uh, an email with a password. They can log in and reset it. That's all built in. Um, what we do with all of the sites we work on, and I think it's quite common, is to integrate with a single sign-on provider. So for councils, that's usually Azure Active Directory, but we've also done integrations with Azure B2C. Uh, there's other things like Okta and is it one logon, I think. I can't there's various others, but they all use uh, industry standard protocols which are supported by Drupal. So uh, it is pretty easy to integrate these into it. Um, so that is one half of it, it means that you can create an account just by logging in with an authorized identity provider. That account won't have permission to do anything. It, you'll log in and everything will look the same. So you'll still have either one of your user managers elevate your permissions, or you can configure it to receive that from Active Directory as well. So you can do it with your IT team to say, it, these users have editor access. Uh, the flip side of that is it really helps with all the compliance. It makes sure that your organizational MFA and risky logon stuff is happening. If someone gets your password and tries to access it from a foreign country and your organization is configured to, to block that, it will also block it accessing the site. Uh, and it's really beneficial for leavers as well, because it means that when someone leaves the council, you don't have to remember to go and remove them from the website because you are relying on that identity provider they immediately lose access to that as well. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so I've probably got time for a couple more quick questions. Um, so Kate asks, uh, is the research that you mentioned in the webinar available online to read? Uh, so the, the research done by Telltale is shared in the local GovDrupal community Slack. So if you join the Slack, you can find it in there. Uh, I don't think it has been published um, externally but I might be wrong on that. We can try and find out about that. Yeah. I think we're, we're planning on following this up with, with links and, and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, so if we can try or we're allowed to get our hands on that, then we'll certainly try and get it involved in um, the follow-up comms after this. Yeah. But yeah, uh, yeah, but if you do join the Slack, it is available in there. So yeah. that is another another way of finding it. 
Brilliant. Um, and finally, just quickly, uh, another question. Uh, is anyone using GovForms as the form builder? Uh, no one that I know of. Um, I think because there is a built-in form builder, uh, a lot of people are using that rather than going into the, the really transactional one. Um, to be honest, I I haven't used GovForms myself yet. Um, I, I don't know, but I've not heard of anyone. I'm sure it, I'm sure it's possible then. It's okay, awesome. man. Can't know everything. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Um, and yeah, thanks to everyone that tuned in. I'm going to have the recording available for you ASAP. So yeah, please do keep, keep an eye on your uh, emails for when that um, for when that pops up. Um, uh, if anyone um, has has any questions they think of after the webinar, I'm sure you can you can either um, get us on hello at nomensa.com um, or um, I'm, I'm sure if you guys don't mind, people can um, people can find you on LinkedIn and and you, and yeah. you can ask any questions there. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely, yeah. uh, our next webinar will be announced very soon, so please do keep an eye on the Nomensa socials for when details of that will be released. Um, um, yeah, thank you, and we'll see you soon. Cheers, Thanks everybody. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you, thank you.